Open invitation for Jamal Williams to join our show at any get time. You can actually, you I, I, I'm yeah. surprised he ain't that in the guy fantasy be in football. Yeah. I'm surprised as well. I think we get him to replace Ooh. Matthew Barry on the show next year. I am yeah. fine with that. Because yeah. yeah, I got news for you. You know what? what? I got three years left to my contract. Yeah. If you want to Kingsbury me, Kingsbury, yeah. I'm good with that. <laughs> if you want, I, I will, I will 100% lay in my big cat. Liam, Liam, you got to have one of them pictures too. I will. I'll, 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 be, I'll, be happy to, I'll, I'll be happy to get a picture. Picture like that. I'm, I got no issue sitting in my big house while NBC pays me, and you guys sit here with Jamal Williams. That act, that term's gonna have a lot of legs. Got Kingsbury. Kingsbury. Yeah, Kingsbury. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's very good. I would totally love to be Kingsbury. Fantasy Football Happy Hour with Matthew Berry, served by Applebee's. All right, welcome to the Fantasy Football Happy Hour with Matthew Barrow. We have not been Kings Buried yet, and we are all wearing pants. I asked! I asked and they refused to Kingsbury me and maybe I, that should have been the thing. If right. I don't wear the pants, exactly. maybe security will come and escort me out. I just every day there's a new learning lesson for me in terms of but <laughs> but you know what? Stupidly I wore pants and here I am, and you're here. fulfilling my contract. And you are Matthew Berry, and this is Lawrence Jackson, the only Jackson playing this weekend, it looks like, and I am Jay yes. Croucher. That was well done. Yeah, you like that? Listen, I did. All right. Do you want me to just set you up on Scott Turner? Just <laughs> get straight into it? You just want to talk about Scott uh -oh, Turner? Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Yeah. yeah? We, could, uh, we can get right into it, the Roto World headlines. Yeah. So a lot of offense coordinators uh, fired this week, a lot of uh, line coaches, a lot of people, a lot of scapegoats. Yeah. yeah. A lot of definitely scapegoats. That, definitely that. So, which camera am I? Am I on camera one? Am I on camera one to address, uh, address th thank you very much. Okay, camera one. <laughs> <laughs> so, the Washington Commanders fired offense coordinator Scott Turner earlier this week. And I have just one simple question. The f <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I, can I... It, is it Scott Turner? Like, how many coaches need to be fired with Carson oh, Wentz good. as their quarterback? A lot of people, po you know, they, the, the offense, you know, wasn't uh, wasn't number one in this and wasn't number one in that. You know what the commanders were number one in? Lawsuits <laughs> and investigations. Every single day there's something on the outside affecting this offense and yet Scott Turner somehow is trying to uh, is trying to coach oh and it's not just it's not just the ownership it's not just what's going on outside and previous regimes he's got to deal with his head coach Ron Rivera saying oh yeah what's the issue the quarterback I, and then the very next day he's got to be like look I you know Ron Rivera is like no no I'm the guy I'm the guy that um, I'm the guy that looked at the analytics I'm the guy that uh, you know looked at the tape and made the decision to bring Carson Wentz here remember the day after when Rivera was was uh, backpedaling He's the one who's just like, yeah, yeah, Carson Wentz is me. Okay, <laughs> Rivera, yeah, you're the one who brought in Carson Wentz. Carson Wentz, you paid $28 million to go two and six with Carson Wentz. Two and six was Carson Wentz's record, and one of those two wins was against the Bears, the team currently with the number one pick in the NFL draft. Nice job. <laughs> nice job there. I'm going to tell you this. Scott Turner, despite the fact that having no offensive line, brutal offensive line. Wasn't Scott Turner's fault that they let Brandon Scherf go, Brandon Scherf go to, uh, to the Jaguars. Wasn't Scott Turner's fault that they traded Trent Williams for a third and a fifth to the Niners because that's all they could get for it mm. because the previous general manager, Bruce Allen, the worst general manager in professional sports history, was enabled by Dan Snyder. Why? I don't know. Maybe Bruce Allen had some stuff on him. Who knows? All I know is this. All I know is this, is that you've got – arguably the greatest left tackle in NFL history, played for the Niners and maybe goes to a Super Bowl, but not in the Commanders because that's how badly they screwed up their relationship with Trent Williams. So it's not his fault, not Scott Turner's fault, that you gave him a patchwork offensive line that led the NFL in sacks this year. No team in the – I'm sorry, third most sacks. They give him the third most sacks during Scott Tur Turner's tenure. Only two teams in the NFL gave up more sacks – during Scott uh, Turner's tenure. Is that his fault? Is that his fault that he doesn't have a quarterback that knows when to get rid of the ball quickly? Should he, should he be calling plays where it's just like, hey, here's a play, don't get sacked. What is how Scott Turner supposed to handle that when he doesn't have anyone that can block for him? I will tell you this is what he did, though. Here's what Scott Turner didn't do. He's like, you know what? I don't have a lot to work with here, so let's try to run the ball effectively. I bet people don't realize this. No team in the NFL had a better time of possession this year than the Washington Commanders. This year, under Scott Turner, they ranked first in total time of possession. 
They were top 12 in rushing yards, despite that crappy offensive line. In fact, starting in week five, once they got Brian Robinson back, they were eighth. They were top eight in rushing yards once Brian Robinson made his debut from week five on. Okay? Here's a list of the quarterbacks that you guys gave Scott Turner to work with. Alex Smith on one leg. Dwayne Haskins, RIP. Kyle Allen. Ryan Fitzpatrick for half a game. Garrett Gilbert, two weeks off of a, a couch. She was, she was good, Gilbert. Carson Wentz. <laughs> Sam Howell, who's 1-0, and by the way, like against Howell. the Cowboys. Sam Howell. And, of course, Taylor Heineke. People point to Taylor Heineke, and they say, like, ah, oh, look at Taylor Heineke. He, only, he finished 19th in QBR this year. He was barely a top-20 quarterback. Are you kidding me? That's an unbelievable accomplishment. Prior to coming to the Commanders, Taylor Heineke couldn't get a snap in the XFL. That is true. He was on the St. Louis Battlehawks in the XFL, but never played a snap. He literally could not get on the field to the XFL. He had no future in football, and that's what you gave Scott Turner. And the fact that he did anything with Taylor Heineke. Look, we all like Taylor Heineke. Like, he's gutty. He's, he's a gunslinger. Taylor Heineke doesn't have an arm, okay? Taylor Heineke is not a starting quarterback in the NFL. He is, at best, a mid-level backup. He, nice player. We like Taylor Heineke. We're rooting for him, but let's be real. From a talent standpoint, he is at best a mid-level backup. And yet, over the last two seasons, he had to start 24 games. And by the way, he was a better option for the Commanders this year than Carson Wentz, chosen by Ron Rivera. Carson Wentz. Carson Wentz. I, how many coaches got Carson Wentz going to get fired? <laughs> I, I just Look, Scott, Scott Turner developed Shame. Logan Thomas. He made Logan Thomas a thing. He developed Jahan Dotson. He developed... Brian Robinson, why does he get no credit for any of those guys? Like, Jahan Dotson missed five games this year. Curtis Samuel missed 12 games last year. Logan Thomas missed 14 games each of the over the last two years. Like, he's working with a patchwork offensive line. He's got different guys in and out. And yet, the commanders have been competitive in every single game. That game plan against the Eagles when they went to Philadelphia, the undefeated Philadelphia Eagles, and they dominated time possession, and they beat the Eagles, the game plan in that game was a master class in play calling. Masterclass. They had no business beating the Eagles that week, and they did. I'm not sitting here saying Scott Turner is the greatest offense coordinator of all time, but what I'm telling you here is that there's a massive amount of problems with the Washington Commanders, and Scott Turner is really low on the list of stuff wrong with the Commanders, and yet they're throwing them under the bus because everyone else is screwing up and didn't do their jobs. And that pisses me off because actually, like, again, if you said to me, hey, Matthew, fix the Commanders, it's a long time before I get to the offense coordinator. It's a long time. Give this guy a quarterback yep. and then make a decision. Ron yep. Rivera, like, when was the last time Ron Rivera had a winning season? I'm asking, in all seriousness. When was the last? <laughs> Blake, get in my <laughs> ear and tell me the last time Ron Rivera had a winning season. When they won the division? Was that 8-9? No, they were, they were, I think they were 7-9. Oh, they, they you got to remember, Ron Rivera forgot that they had even missed the playoffs a couple weeks uh, ago. He didn't even he didn't know, know right. He didn't even know, right? Right. 2017. 2017. I've got bad news. It's the news. last time Ron Rivera actually had a winning record. But, yeah, sure, let's fire Scott Turner. Yep. Well, I've got bad news, Matthew. After you swore, they cut us off the air, so you're going to have to do all that again. But, I don't um, care. All right, now, Lawrence, your turn to do the same but speech. I'm right. To camera <laughs> three about Michael Crow. Right. <laughs> I'm right. I'm right on that. All Justice right. for Scott Turner. All right. Justice for Scott Turner. Let's talk about Michael Fleur, who's out as Jets offensive coordinator, Lawrence. What do you think of this move? Yeah, you know, I don't, ha I don't got no emotional ties to the New York Jets like our friend Matthew does here so you're uh, gonna give a speech. To, to, the, uh, <laughs> to, the, to the commanders. But I feel the same way. Somebody had to be a scapegoat in this uh, situation. Something, something that Mike LaFleur did do well. He made sure that his best players got the ball in their hands. When Brees Hall was healthy, that's who the offense focused around. When he went out, unfortunately, that shifted to Garrett Wilson. He also thrived. So they, the offense had some success. And, again, what are you working with here at quarterback? You got Mike White, just like Taylor Heineke. Right. We like him, but he's he liked Taylor Heineke, a mid-level backup. You got your number two overall pick. He ain't playing worth nothing. You know what I'm saying? Like, now you down to Joe Flacco. In the, right. in the la Like, you would rather have played Joe Flacco in the last game to knock the Dolphins out the playoffs, right, than play your healthy number two overall pick. Thank but you. then again, somebody got somebody to gotta take the hit. They also uh, fired their quarterback coach and the offensive line coach too. So everybody get hit, it seems, except the people who post to get it.
Yep, I'm with you there, Lawrence. This was an all this was the most uncomfortable game of the season to watch, I think. Just watching Zach Wilson implode on Thursday night football against the Jags. This is the last time right. we saw the field on a this short season. Week, on a short week, uh, you know, in the rain, like there's so much pressure. He'll do better in a new situation, new coach, new city. New York, um, New York media has claimed another one. Look, I'm not saying it's he's faultless, but like there's a reason why he was the number two overall. When he was picked number two overall, it wasn't like everyone was like, what? Him? Are you crazy? He was highly thought of by the entire NFL scouting community. So um, we have higher hopes. I mean, listen, nowhere to go but up for, uh, for Zach Wilson. But you're right. It just. Is Zach Wilson definitely gone, though? I, I, I don't know how he returns to New York. I don't know. He says they be talking uh, like they like, hey, we committed to him. That's what. Uh, that's what he. But you say, know, they're just saying that to get some trade. Some yeah. you know. Uh, Maybe. You know, yeah. Try to try to try to listen. Look, it's not been good for Zach Wilson. It has not There's been no good for, for Zach Wilson. He seems to have sort of regressed, you know, over the last year and, uh, you know. Sometimes, by the way, sometimes there's just a better fit with a with an offensive coordinator and um, play call. Like, whatever. Zach Wilson has not been good. Like, there's no way to there's no way to sort of couch that. Yeah, he has but, not been good. And look, I think the Jets' offense, the context will be better the next season when they get Brace Hall back, get Mackay yeah. Becton, AVT. They're going to have weapons. Maybe they bring in another wide receiver to complement Garrett Wilson and Elijah Moore. They probably bring in another just, quarterback. Yeah. But coordinators just, again, being made to be know, made, the uh, like scapegoats. Like, yeah. ag- again, like, like, ever, like, again, yeah, Michael Floor didn't draft Zach Wilson. No, and he didn't get the right. yips. Right. Either. A thousand percent. Scott Turner not only didn't draft or didn't, you know, didn't sign Carson Wentz, it wasn't his decision to start Carson Wentz against the Browns. Which, True. by the way, that's a game they should have won, and that's a game that cost them the playoffs. I, I, I mean, just like that was Ron Rivera's call. Yeah. And it was the wrong call. Obviously, Wentz throws three picks, and they, they're awful. But, uh, you know, yeah. like, Scott Turner's out there doing the best he can with what he's been given to work with. Yeah. Like, there's only I, so much you can do. I think with Lafleur in the Vikings game, Jets-Vikings, Mike White had Garrett Wilson wide open down the right sideline. Yep. It would have been like mm-hmm. an 80-yard touchdown yeah. that Mike White just overthrew. Yep. Mike White doesn't overthrow that ball by half a yard. Then Mike Lafleur might have a job today. That's just how which, which this goes. Uh, right. We talk about offensive quarters coordinators being made scapegoats not sure that's necessarily the case in new england uh it's, it's been reported that the patriots are expected to make changes to the offensive staff with uh matt patricia and joe judge they split play calling duties i'm all for this <laughs> i don't think there's scapegoats surprise, here. surprise surprise i believe in mac jones i'm buying mac jones stock he was so good in his rookie year despite not having amazing weapons yes had a good offensive line but i think that they will fix things in new england next year let's say matthew Barry. I, I i agree with you it, it's too well run of an organization they know this was not ideal and so belichick will go back and and They'll find somebody. They'll find a, a true offense coordinator. I'm with you on Mac Jones. Look, I, the Commanders need a quarterback. Mac Jones would be the best quarterback on the Commanders right now. If, yeah, if, easy, if, easy. If, easy, right? Easy. You know I mean, like, so uh, I'm with you on 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 Mac Jones and nowhere to go but up for uh, for the Patriots. We'll see about the Jets and the Commanders. Again, it's hard to, until we know who their offensive coordinator is and what kind of system they're going to run. It's hard to sort of project certain. Look, we know Garrett Wilson and Terry McLaurin are going to be stars no matter what. But it's, you know, figuring out what the, the offensive play calling tendencies are of whoever gets that job uh, will go a long way to us determining the fantasy value of the players on those teams. It, anyway. Right. What's happening in the NFL? A lot AFC is happening in the NFL. Also, I'm, I'm super annoyed. A lot I, happening in the I've AFC. I've hit it well. Wow. I've hit it well. But I, <laughs> you know, I know I've played it, you know, kind of cool here. But I, if I'm being lying, if I'm not li- uh, if I'm being honest with you guys, I'm annoyed with my commanders. How do you not have a say in who the next, you know, coordinator? Like, the, I mean, me. let's be real. Come on. Come Jason on. Wright, you got my cell phone. Yeah. Hit me up. How you ain't miss? If I were any of these teams, I'd want Frank Reich as the offensive coordinator. I think Frank Reich, he hasn't shown anything to not suggest that he's a very good offensive play caller. Well, head coach of it, maybe he's, iffy, I mean, but he's offensive coordinator. For the, he's interviewing for the Panthers' head coaching job, and, you know, I, I mean, he's he's in the mix there. But, yes, I would agree with you. He's a very good offensive coordinator. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. The commander should make it – Anyway, I'm not going to get it. <laughs> my man hurt for real. <laughs> yeah, it really hurt. Who do, you, who do you want as your quarterback next year, Matthew, for the Commanders? You, you want him to go Matt Aaron Rodgers? You want him to trade four first-round picks for Lamar Jackson? 
You want to get Derek Carr, Jimmy J? Any of those guys would be fun. <laughs> Any of those guys. Mike White. Uh, anyone, no, not Mike, not, not Mike yeah. White. Mac Jones. The truth of the matter is, is that I, what I, I said this after the, um, just before the Bears game, uh, when they were, I want to say they were one in five at that point. I said, they're not making the playoffs. They should just go to Sam Howell and let him play the entire year and see what they have. When Carson Wentz got hurt, I was just like, play. And then, then they ended up winning and then they kept winning under Heineke, so they, you know, and they had a shot yeah, at the playoffs, yeah. but, so I get why they, they didn't go to Sam Howell, but kind of want to see what you get out of Sam Howell, would, would, you know, and again, they've been competitive enough that they're not likely going to get a first, you know, be yeah. eligible to get a, um, a, a decent quarterback this year, like a young quarterback. He so. almost didn't get that start in week 18 either, yep. right? Taylor Heineke was like, hey man, this, this dude, Right. He deserved to play, man. Heineke just like the hell with it. Let this rookie start. Let him see what he do. Hey, Heineke's they, a good, they, 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 a good dude. And yeah. they, and right. They exactly. On they were going to start on. They were going to start on Heineke because, yeah. again, Rivera didn't realize they had been eliminated from the playoffs. He's <laughs> yeah. like, we still got a shot. There we got to beat Dallas. Yeah. And then, yeah. there like, you oh, go. and then he, he got but the memo. Like, before we go to break, also a good dude. Derek Carr said goodbye to the Raiders this morning, saying that he looks forward to a new city and a new team. So no surprises there. Uh, you don't bench your franchise quarterback yeah. when you're still alive for the playoffs and then expect to bring him back the next season. So we'll see what happens with Derek Carr. Lots he'll be of teams a, he'll be a quarterback. starting quarterback somewhere. And you know what? He's fine. He is he's in the Kirk Cousins range. Yes. I would argue Daniel you, Jones. I, yeah, I would argue you can win with Derek Carr. Like is again, is he Aaron Rodgers, Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, somebody that can like sort of put you or Aaron, what Aaron Rodgers used to be? Is he somebody like a Allen or a Mahomes that Burrow, can or yeah. Burrow that can sort of put you on your back and say like I'm I'm going to will this team to win. No, he's not that guy. But he's a guy that if you give him weapons and, you know, give him a good offensive system that you can win with, 100%. Derek Carr would be the best quarterback the Commanders have had in 20 years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and no, seriously, since yeah. Kirk Cousins, right? I mean, since RG3's rookie year. Because yeah. like, Kirk yeah. Cousins was fine with Washington. He was fine. Like, I mean, that got him paid. Well, he franchise, you know, yeah, yeah, he's yeah, stacking yeah. But bread. Like that, but that's the state of quarterback. I mean, think about some yeah. of the quarterbacks that are going to make a start this week in the playoffs. Like, we're likely going to see Skylar Thompson. Some we're of them ain't better than Carr. So, right. Some, <laughs> we're going to likely see, like, either Tyler Huntley or Anthony Brown this weekend. We're, we're likely going to – we're going to see Daniel Jones. We're going to see um, – uh, we're going to see Brock Purdy. Like, wow. It, like, if you ranked all the quarterbacks that are playing in the playoffs this weekend – like, Derek Carr is, like, the fourth-best quarterback on that list. Fourth Indeed. or fifth, right? I mean, yeah. he's, like, he's somewhere in that list. I, it's All right. And on that note, we have to go to break. Derek Carr, fourth or fifth-best quarterback in, right. I mean, in maybe AFC he, World Cup. Maybe when we come back, AFC Wild Card game maybe previews. He's, maybe he's sixth or whatever, but I'm just saying, like, Commandos. Derek Carr will be a starting quarterback somewhere in the NFL next year. Mark my words. From the gun, Denver rushes three. Flacco stepped up. Throws deep, far sideline, Jacoby Jones, pounded it at the 20, ah! Jacoby Jones, touchdown, ah! Raven, and the miracle is answered. God, let me tell you, Joe Flacco was not making any of those throws on Sunday in Miami, Lawrence. That, that, that looked like it was 10 years ago. It is the 10th anniversary of the Mile High Miracle. Still not sure what Raheem Moore was doing on that play with that uh, that route that he took to uh, Jacoby Jones. But uh, and he it, one probably of the, still the best feel terrible moments. about it. Yeah, so sorry for bringing it up again. Yeah, Raheem. exactly. You guys are mean. <laughs> you guys are <laughs> chaos. It was a ter- ter- terrible for the play. record, it was not my choice to, to show that play. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Raheem. So, well, anyway. lots going on with the Ravens. Nothing really good. They are eight and a half point favorites in Cincinnati against the Bengals, who they just lost to. The total is 40 and a half. And the big story is Lamar Jackson. Yep. And here is John Harbour talking about Lamar's status. With, with Lamar, just one more, uh, you know, how comfortable would you guys be at, at playing Lamar if he was able to go at less than 100%? Of course, yeah. Whatever, as long as he's safe and healthy and can play, it's for any player. It's not really just any particular player. I mean, any player goes out there and if he's sa- healthy and safe and it's not going to do any damage to an injury, any player, you know, plays and does what he can uh, to the level that he can in that situation. All right, Lamar has missed 16 straight practices. The line jumped from Bengals minus 6.5 to minus 8.5. And, 
expectation. And also, Tyler Huntley's banged up too. Looks yeah. like he is going to play. If not, it'll be the Anthony Brown show again. Anthony Brown, who did a little, little bit against the Bengals, but I don't think he's about to go in and beat Joe Burrow on the road. Fantasy-wise, are there any Ravens you're interested in in this game, Lawrence? Um, just the usual Mark Andrews, you know, even with uh, Anthony Brown, he threw for 286 last week, uh, 286 yards, 152 of those went to tight ends, Isaiah Likely and uh, Charlie Kohler, two rookie tight ends. So you can always count on the Ravens throwing to their tight ends. They rested Mark Andrews last week for this game. So whether it's Anthony Brown, kind of hope it ain't, or it's Huntley, uh, no, no, my my bad, uh, Anthony Brown. But Oris Huntley, we uh we could count on Mark Andrews being vital. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I just look. I mean, Dobbins and Gus Edwards split carries. They're not involved in the passing game. So if you're thinking about PPR scoring, and just so everyone knows, just what we're when we're talking about DFS here, and obviously there's a lot of different playoff formats out there, and so we're just trying to talk generally. But if we're specific, we're using DraftKings prices. We'll just say that you know. Off the top here, obviously there are a lot of places to play DFS, including FanDuel. We love them all. Uh, but just to pick a, pick something, DraftKings, which uses PPR scoring, they have bonuses like at, you know 100 yards rushing or receiving. So we're using that to discuss this. And, yeah, it just given like PPR scoring, like if you're playing in a half-point PPR, it, it hurts Dobbins and Edwards less. But in essence, with those guys, you need a touchdown to pay off. They are going to try to run the ball, but as your point, yeah. as eight-and-a-half-point under, eight underdogs – I don't know how long they're going to be able to stick with the run against Cincinnati. My expectation here is full health for the Bengals offense, and I think they just explode. I think it's a big game for Burrow and Jamar Chase. who oh, Chase always seems to kill the Ravens here. And so, um, you know, this game is in Cincinnati. They're ready. They played a very kind of vanilla offense last week, just enough to sort of get the win and make sure they had this home game. But, yeah, I'm – Things are – look, you never seem that excited listen, about this game listen, on NBC on Sunday night, Matthew. Lamar Jackson well, not playing – Lamar Jackson probably not playing in this game is just messing up my playoff experience for this season. So, it's like, you yeah, know. Don't they, don't they understand what Lawrence, <laughs> yeah, Lawrence is against here? <laughs> hey, but, hey, but Lamar, you know what I'm saying? Get healthy first, dog. That's all. That's, yeah. Just worry about that. Get healthy know? and then go play for the New York Jets next year. We'd love oh, to yeah. see it. I, I think the book on the Ravens secondary has always been they really struggle with speed. Uh, yeah. We saw what Jamar Chase uh, and T. Higgins did to them last season. We saw what Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddell did to them in the fourth quarter in week two. Uh, Jamar Chase as well. He was the one bright spot on the Bengals offense, which basically did nothing against Baltimore on the weekend. Jamar went eight for 86, and that touchdown you're seeing now, he's targeted 13 times. So, Matthew, you think Jamar is worth paying up for in DFS? I do. Again, he, he's averaging over 17 fantasy points per game in the two games he played against the Baltimore Ravens this year. Gets over 12 targets a game. And so Chase, who's had double digit fantasy points in nine out of 12 games this year, I, I just think this is a matchup that is built for him. I think it's going to be a high scoring game on the Cincinnati side of the ball. Baltimore, pretty good run defense, so I don't know that Mixon has a ton of success here. So the expectation is that they, they move the ball through the air. I do think Chase is worth paying up for. And I think that, you know, him and Justin Jefferson are probably the top two wide receiver plays on the slate this weekend. Yep, yeah. I agree with that. All right, let's go to Chargers Jags, also on NBC. Jags are two-point favorites. The total is a healthier 47 and a half. Now, Lawrence, Austin Eckler is going to be, he's one of the most expensive running backs uh, going around. Is he worth paying up for in a pretty favorable matchup against the Jags? Well, this is the easy answer right here. Of course he is, right? Even, even in the game in week 18 where the Chargers starters got taken out, he put up 11 points. Like, that's a bad game for Austin Eckler. Now, his targets and receptions went down after Mike Williams and Keenan Allen came back, but you know what didn't get down? His touchdown production. There's only six games this season where he did not score a touchdown. So I love them eyes. You get near the goal line, that's probably an Austin Eckler touchdown, and you want touchdowns in a, in a receiver that's going, I'm sorry, a running back that's going to get you production receiving. 
Yep. I think with Ekola as well, like you look back to when these two teams played back in week three and the Chargers lost 38-10 at home to the Jags. I think you just throw that game completely out. It was so Too long far ago. Away, yeah. So long ago. Also, that was the game where Justin Herbert was coming off the ribs. Seemed like he wasn't going to play and then he did play, but he kind of looked like he was dealing with a serious rib yeah. injury. So I would yeah. just throw that game out. And in that game, look, Ekola had four carries for five yards. That's just not going to repeat, Matthew. I would agree with that. Look, I mean, we love Austin Eckler. I, I, I do this thing with uh, with Madden where I'm, you know, I've been uh, selecting their player of the week for the Madden Ultimate Team, and I was recently given the honor to select the player of the year for the Madden Ultimate Team, and I chose Austin Eckler. So you guys, I know, you know, I love Austin Eckler, friend of the show, friend of the podcast. Uh, we've had him here, the number one fantasy running back. He's had six touchdowns, as you said, in the last five games, so they're using him a lot in that. I will say, though, if I'm paying up at running back, He's only $600 less than Christian McCaffrey. Yeah. And I think if I was going to pay up for one running back, I'd rather actually pay the extra $600 for McCaffrey against Seattle than mm -hmm. Eckler. Because what you need with Eckler here is not, not only <laughs> touchdowns, but you need him to be involved in the passing game. Now, so far, that's worked. Like, Herbert has just been not throwing deep, and he's been, you know, dumping off, especially, by the way, if Mike Williams ends up missing this game. Like, you would expect Eckler to be involved in the passing game here. Uh, but... Yeah, we expect good things from uh, Austin Eckler against the Jaguars. Yep, and Lawrence, I think the guy that you really want to pay up for in this game is Keenan Allen, who has had 14-plus targets in three of his past six games. He's going up against the Jags' pass defense that is, is basically terrible. And Josh Dobbs really moved the ball pretty efficiently against the Jags' pass defense. That's the thing with the Jags. That run defense is excellent, but the secondary is no good. Yeah, man. I mean, really, Keenan Allen just been balling since he's come back from that hamstring injury. The past five weeks, almost 11 targets and nine catches per game. He's seeing double-digit targets every other game. And when he doesn't get those double-digit targets, he's getting nine or right. eight, you know, something like that. Like, that's Justin Herbert's guy. Mike Williams is his deep ball guy, but Keenan Allen is his guy. Yeah, since he came back in week 13, he's the third best wide receiver in fantasy on a points per game basis. If Mike Williams plays in this game, he's probably going to be less than 100%. The expectation here is that, yes, Keenan Allen is the focal point of a passing offense that's going to have success against the Jaguars secondary. So I agree with you on, on Keenan Allen. And worth noting, by the way, again, if you're just sort of looking um, for cheap options, if Mike Williams were to miss this game, Josh Palmer becomes kind of interesting. Yep, right? definitely. On the Jags side, very uneven offensive game for them against the Titans. Trevor Lawrence looked a little bit, little bit nervous, maybe. Kind of missing Zay Jones wide open in the end wide zone. Open. Just making Brutal. throws that he just doesn't make. It's like he was sailing everything high. Like he just yeah. didn't want to get picked. Yeah. So I think he'll be better for the runoff of that, which is basically a playoff game for the Jags. Now, Matthew, in terms of Jags wide receivers, Christian Kirk, he kind of, if he was on a menu, he'd order himself, basically. Christian Kirk, you lock him in. Uh, but what's the interest like in Zay Jones and Evan Ingram? Yeah, I mean, I think both guys are interesting. It's Evan Ingram, to me, is a really nice play because he's, he's one of the cheaper tight ends. He's 4,200 on, on DraftKings. Eight or more targets in three of the last five games uh, since week 13, again, since Keenan Allen came back. and um, Sorry, over the same time frame, right? But since week 13... He's the second best tight end in fantasy on a points per game basis, obviously skewed by that one big game. But I do think if you don't want to pay up at the position, right, and obviously we're in a weekend and when there's no Travis Kelsey and there's no Dallas Goddard. Um, so if you're like, hey, I don't want to, I don't want to pay Kittle. I'm, I'm nervous about Andrews. Uh, all of a sudden, Evan Ingram becomes pretty interesting at the position. Uh, again, the, the Chargers secondary, pretty beat up. Yes, and has been all season since J.C. Jackson marquee signing went down. Lawrence, um, yeah, Lawrence, what do you make of Lawrence? Trevor Lawrence, uh, after that yeah. struggle. And, and, and by the way, struggle. and Zay Jones, just five Jones, Zay Jones had now five different games, you know, uh, with double digit targets. Like, he's a nice player. And again, to your point, if he gets hit with that touchdown, like, yeah. he's wide open. And if Lawrence hits him, I think the narrative on him is pretty different. As you, as you see there on your screen, um, the difference between him and Evan Ingram in terms of the, the, the threats. I mean, I think both guys are viable in, in a game that we should think a, a, a lot of points should be scored in, in this one. Um, again, we're sort of throwing out that week three game against the Chargers. Just yeah, a weird, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. Sort of a, just sort of a weird game. But both guys score. Both guys get targets. Um, I, I think they will... Um, I think they'll be able to move the ball effectively here. Yep. Lawrence, I, any concerns about, as Matthew calls him, T-Law? So, if you do have concerns about him, right, you spoke about the, the Titans game already, right? 
I would stack him with Travis Etienne because if the running, I'm sorry, if the passing game don't get going, but the running game does, and we know about the Chargers running defense, they've yep. given up at least 100 yards to running backs three of the last four games. That's Latavius Murray, Kent Akers, and of course, Derrick Henry. ETN, on the other hand, has averaged over 77 rushing yards his last four games. That's including the dud 17 yards he had against Tennessee. So if you can't get anything out of that passing game, you can at least fall back on the running back who should be able to have some success against the Chargers run defense. Yep. All right, let's go to Dolphins Bills. Now, there was a lot of discussion around the Bills not getting the one seed because the game against Cincinnati uh, was effectively canceled. Well, football gods have conspired to effectively give the Bills a bye anyway because they are 13 point favorites. <laughs> Over Skylar Thompson, Tua Tagovailoa, I think thankfully is not going to play, to be honest. Uh, and Teddy Bridgewater looks like he's not going to play either. So it's Bills minus 13. The total is 43 and a half. Matthew, is Josh Allen worth paying up for in this spot? I actually don't think so. I okay. think because, I, again, with Skylar Thompson, maybe there's a defensive touchdown. I, they may not need Josh Allen to do all that much. And so when you think about how expensive he is at quarterback, I, I, is Josh Allen going to have a good game? Of course he's not going to be. Josh yeah. Allen, but I actually don't think I would pay up for him. I think I would rather go cheaper at quarterback or go with some other options because that's that would be my nervousness is, is that Josh Allen just doesn't have a monster game because he doesn't need to. I think they'll be able to run the ball effectively uh, against the Dolphins. I think, again, there might be a defensive touchdown, short fields. They're not going to have to sustain drives. You could see Josh Allen sitting out the fourth quarter yeah, in this one because it just gets yeah. out of hand. They're almost two touchdown, they're almost two touchdown favorites uh, against the Dolphins, and honestly, as this game gets closer, I bet that line rises. It may actually close at over minus 14. I agree. Once it's one, like right now, it's it's trending towards Skylar Thompson. Once that gets absolutely confirmed, then I mean, there's not a person in America who's taking Skylar Thompson plus 13 in Buffalo. You're gonna need two touchdowns to do that, I think. Now, Lawrence, on Miami's side of the ball, assuming it is Skylar Thompson. Do you have any interest riding with Tyreek Hill? Tyreek Hill's receiving prop on BetMGM is 62 and a half yards. I don't think it's been that low uh, ever. I can't remember when it was ever yeah, that yeah. low, but Probably he is high dealing. School. Yeah, <laughs> he's dealing with the ankle injuries, limping around against the Jets. Couldn't do anything against Sauce Gardner. Uh, any interest in paying for Tyreek Hill or Jalen Waddle? Man, you know I love Tua in this Miami offense. I like I love watching them, but Skylar Thompson has had his play extended time in three games this season. Weeks 5, week 17, and week 18. And in those three games, Tyree Hill's averaging 4.3 catches and 41 yards a game. That's a lot of football played. Jalen Waddle, three and a half receptions and 39 re uh, receiving yards per game. So I, I don't think it's worth the price because you, uh, then you're dealing with injuries to both of the wide receivers. You know what I'm saying? They both nicked up. You've got the third string quarterback and He's no Brock Purdy here. Um, so I, I, I'm going to say, nah, man, like you'll need a catching big run, but I don't want to bank on that. Yeah, I mean, like, again, we're, 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 we're doing this conversation through the context of, like, if you were doing a DraftKings or a DFS kind of lineup, we think Tyreek Hill's going to be fine. Like, Josh Allen's going to have a good game here. But, right, I mean, like, for $1,000 more on DraftKings, you could have Jamar Chase yep. than Tyreek Hill. Yep. Right? Easy and so, like, decision. And right, the only, the only argument for Tyreek Hill in that situation versus Jamar Chase is if you're in a large tournament and you're trying to be contrarian here and because I think the, the roster percentage of Jamar Chase is going to be much higher yes. than Tyreek Hill this weekend. But, right, I mean, like a quarterback, right, Josh Allen is not only the most expensive guy on the board, but he's $1,000 more than Joe Burrow. And do we think he's going to be $1,000 worth of more production than Joe Burrow? I don't. Yeah, you know I mean, nah. like I, I think – I think the Ravens keep it close enough that Burrow has to play the whole game. That's my nervousness. Josh Allen's going to be great for as long as he's in there. It's just, you know, so. But, again, like if I'm in a larger playoff pool, I don't mind using Josh Allen. I've seen some leagues where uh, you can use a player once throughout the playoffs. So, like, in a situation like that, we feel pretty good that the, the Bills are going to win. I'd want to save Josh Allen for the next round. Yep. So, I'm using, like, a – it, you know, I'd use like Justin Herbert because I, I actually think the Jaguars win that game, right? You know, I mean, you want to use guys that, that are probably going to be one and done but might be might put up points. Yep. I would say Tyreek Hill, fantasy-wise, is probably the highest variance player on the slate yep. this week just because there's a chance he could just come out there and he could, have, he could be two catches for 23 yards and just do nothing and have his ankle just limit him to nothingness. 
could also be a situation where he was banged up with his ankle against the Chargers in prime time, was on the injury report, and then played the Bills on a short week and just looked fine. Just looked like right, Tyreek yeah. Hill. So he could have anywhere from 20 receiving us to 170, and you're just, you're just playing a guessing game. Yeah, yeah, that, it's true. And he's one of those guys that all he needs is one play. Yep. Right, and so, and they'll scheme him up, and, you know, again, if they're down big and they're throwing a lot, same with him and Jalen Waddle. Waddle had over 100 receiving yards in both games. Like, remember the last game against Buffalo? He'd sort of been, kind of been in a little bit of a slump, and then just, you know, in that that uh, that crazy, I believe it was Saturday night game, yeah. Bills-Dolphins, um, last time it was in Buffalo, and, you know, he yeah. was just, he was just awesome, right? Yeah. I mean, Bills have struggled again in their secondary this year. They give up the seven most fantasy points to opposing wide receivers. Teams do have to throw against them. They'll coach Skylar Thompson up, and Mike McDaniel will try to create some mismatches, some just bubble screens, quick slants to try to get them the ball quickly and use their speed and yards after the catch. I, but I prefer Waddle to Hill in this one, just based on the price. Like he's, you know, he's yeah, fifteen hundred dollars cheaper, price, and yeah. he's also had success against Miami in both games this year. Yep, Lawrence, any interest in any of the running backs in this game? I, I was just going to bring that up. It's interesting. They ran the ball well against the Bills the last time they played them. But then again, Raheem Mostert, he's not healthy either. You don't really want, you know, Raheem Mostert nor. Uh, J uh, sorry, uh, Jeff Wilson. Wilson. Jeff, Jeff Wilson. Jeff, you don't want either one of them shoulder and the whole low. They're good when they're together, you know. But it, it, it's just it's gonna be tough. The 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 first two games these two teams played each other this season, the total the the point differential was two points and three points, and now you got a thirteen point spread. Yep. No, I'm I mean, with you though. I mean, look, Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle both have averaged single digit fantasy points in the. Tyler, in the in the games in which Skylar Thompson has played 90% or more of the snaps, yeah. uh, the majority of the work here, and again, in a game in which they are almost two touchdown underdogs, it's going to be hard to see them really, quote, establishing the run here, and yep. it just, you just don't feel good about anyone in this game at all. No, you don't. All right, let's get to some of the best bets from AFC Wildcard Weekend, courtesy of our friends at BetMGM. Now, these are all my bets, fellas, so I hope you like them. Three overs, we'll have some unders in the NFC, I promise. Austin Eckler, over 36 and a half receiving yards. The Jags give up the most receiving yards to running backs yep. in the NFL. Get like eight one. targets for 48 receiving yards the first time they met. Dolphins, Bills, James Cook, over 36 and a half rushing yards. The look here is basically that he's had more carries than Devil, Devin Singletary the past two weeks and two games that the Bills have needed to win. And for a potential RB1 for a team that is a 13 point favorite and trending up, I just think 36 and a half yards is too low. And then the great Samaj P. Ryan, over 16 and a half rushing yards. He's gone over in seven of the past eight. And Joe Mixon only missed two of those games. And I just think with how badly the Bengals struggled to run the ball against the Ravens, with Mixon going 11 for yeah, 27, yeah. I think there's a chance that they just change it up a bit more with Samaj P. Ryan. 16 and a half isn't very high at all. No, I okay. like all those bets, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Matthew. There Matt. you go. Oh, well I appreciate done. that. Nice uh, job. Good so job, Jay. Samaje will score on that 116-yard on run. Yeah, he'll do <laughs> yeah. that. All right, we're going to go to break. When we come back, we'll break down the NFC wildcard games. So sunk into the, the being Lions fans, man. We, we love the Lions. Uh, Coach Campbell did a great job with his crew, and they played a fantastic football game to, to get the win, to give us the chance. So um, we're going to try to do something with it. Uh, unfortunately, we're playing <laughs> the Niners, and they're loaded, and they're loaded and healthy and on a roll and about as hot as you could possibly get. And uh, doing it in a really commanding fashion, too, you know, with the young quarterback who's doing so well, um, just kind of buck the odds, you know, that everybody would think you could do that, and uh, everybody in the media anyway. All right, that was the youngest looking 71 year old man on planet Earth, the great Pete Carroll, like Keanu Reeves. He just never gets older, Matthew Barry. I like him saying, and the young quarterback. Do you think he just <laughs> didn't know Brock Purdy's name? <laughs> yeah. He's playing, I think he's playing some mind games across the board there. Yeah, yeah he, he might be the sandbagging Niners. his own team. He's talking up, uh, he's, he's talking up the, uh, the 49ers. 
He's yeah. not wrong, though. No, well, yeah. Not wrong at all. Not wrong. Yeah, great scout He's not wrong at all. <laughs> yeah. MGM wrong. agrees. The Seahawks are nine and a half point underdogs to the 49ers. The total is 42 and a half. And fantasy-wise, I think the big question about this game, Matthew, is whether Christian McCaffrey is worth paying up for the second most expensive player out there. Uh, just Justin Jefferson in front of him. I, I, I think he is. I, I certainly think he is. First off, again, game script should should favor him as well. It's a great match against Seattle. They give him the fourth most fantasy points to running backs this season. Uh, he's had 135 or more scrimmage yards in four of the last five games. Obviously, the number two running back in fantasy on a points-per-game basis this year. If he'd been in San Francisco the entire year, I think he's the number one. I don't think it's particularly close. Like, And you think about that one game, that Thursday night game against Seattle where McCaffrey was part of the Niners, 25.8 fantasy points. You know, just had a just a monster game, and that the the defense, Seattle's defense is a is a work in progress. Uh, I just think there's I think McCaffrey has, uh, McCaffrey has that rare combination of both an incredibly high floor, yes, and incredibly high upside. Yep. I, I mean, like he like in a bad game, a bad game for McCaffrey, I think he earns you the money. And a great game for McCaffrey, I think he's worth it. If that makes any sense, like no, I just, yeah. like, you know, he, 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 look, he's not going to screw you. Look, week 18, everybody was getting carries. Elijah Mitchell, Jordan Mason, Ty Davis Price, all it, all CMC needed was 13 touches to get 16 fantasy points. Like, that's close to his floor right there. Mm-hmm. Like, he, like, you good with that. We know in the playoffs he going to get more than 13 touches. They were just whooping up on them Cardinals then, so they let him chill a little bit. But like you said, like – the floor is like you still chilly. Yeah, and I also just think at the running back position there aren't a lot of other guys that you you know that you that you like you don't love. You know we talked about Eckler right, and I do think Etienne's interesting, but like you know the Baltimore Cincinnati game you don't love any of the running backs in there Buffalo, in terms Miami, of the and their and their price like you know Cook and Barkley against each other both good running backs but also decent run defenses that they're gonna that they're gonna face there as well. So it just you sort of you don't feel right, you know. We, I don't know that I feel great about the Bills guys are all going to split carries. The the Dolphins are in a negative game script. Just as you sort of go through the games and you're like, all right, well, if I don't go running back here, you certainly don't like Ken Walker on the other side of this going against San Francisco. So I just yeah. I sort of feel like he's worth paying up for, and I wouldn't mind going cheaper at at least a couple of the well, you know wide receiver positions. Maybe I think you can go cheap at quarterback this weekend. I'm paying up for CMC. Yep, Lawrence yeah. Debo Samuel, remember him? feel like we yeah, haven't really yeah, kind of, of course, absorbed of the Debo yeah, experience yeah. this year. He was arguably the best player on the Niners last season. Now I think if you're thinking Niners this year, you're thinking Brock Purdy, you're thinking McCaffrey, you're thinking Nick Bosa, you're thinking Kyle Shanahan before you're thinking Debo <laughs> Samuel. But he is one of the most talented players in football. Would you rather pay up for him or Brandon Ayuk this week? Who, who, who's, who's costing more right now? Because Believe I, it or not, Ayuk's a thousand, a $100 more. He's, that, they're both cheap, 5800 to 5700 yeah. for Ayuk for Samuel. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to go Debo. And, and their receiving prop, uh, Debo's is 43 and a half to Ayuk's 48 and a half. Debo got got his feet back wet coming back from injury last week. I think Debo about to show us the real Debo now that it's playoff time. You got the you got the Seahawks defense. Matthew mentioned them earlier. Um, they give up a lot of fantasy points. And look, Brock Purdy's in his first start. Uh, Debo scored 16 points, 16 fantasy points in that game against the Bucks. So it's not like he can't get it going with Brock Purdy. It was just for a short period of time before he got hurt. I think Debo about to show us. Well, look, they're basically the same. They're basically the same price, and so the the only anti Debo argument is health. Yep. But if we think he's fully mm-hmm. healthy, which which we we seem to assume that he is. Yeah. He's better than Brandon Ayuk. He, he is just better. is. Yeah. I mean, again, and that's no disrespect to Brandon Ayuk, but Debo's just better. There, there's more ways they can use him on offense. They're more versatile. Yeah. They know that if they're going to go long into these playoffs, if the Nor- Niners are going to have the kind of run that they think they can have, Debo Samuel has got to be a big part of this offense. Right. And so my expectation here is that they're going to try to use him and get him going, you know, sort of have a big game, get that confidence going. So uh, I think both guys have big games here, certainly like Kittle. Again, there's a reason why they're almost double-digit favorites in this one. But I agree with Lawrence. I'm going Debo Samuel over Brandon Ayuk if we're 
if we're picking between the two. Yep. The one thing I will say about Ayuk is that he's had this time over the past six weeks to really create chemistry with Brock Purdy. Sure, of course. The only time yeah. that Brock Purdy really had to drive down the field at the end of the game and win it was against the Raiders uh, at the end of regulation. And he just looked for Brandon Ayuk every single time. I think they have that chemistry. Look, I agree. This game, it's probably you can, you know, you can build the chemistry with Debo because they're probably going to be winning yep. uh, big. But if it is close, I do think that he will look for Ayuk. And, and they, they've got a way to manufacture touches for yes. C Samuel in a way that they don't really do yeah. as much for Ayuk. So yep. that's the other thing. Yep. But, yeah, there's no question. I, again, I think both guys are viable. Yeah we, yeah, we ain't sitting here being like, oh, just don't use one and not the other. It's right. like, yeah, we, yes. we kind of, at this point today, we kind of splitting hairs because Debo just yeah. coming back. No, the truth matter here, Lawrence, is that Jay <laughs> is making us choose. It's a dumb choice. <laughs> It's a completely Why manufactured, doing it, it's completely yeah. manufactured like for television. Him, man. it's, it's, it's completely manufactured television. <laughs> like it's just chaos. like him just being a, a jerk yeah. is what it is, <laughs> Lauren. So whatever. It's confirmed. Don't yeah. make me choose. He's Blame about to make choose. us do it again, yeah. too. Yeah. DK oh. Metcalf will tie a lock at Lawrence. See, he just did it again. A thousand percent, yeah. Uh, well, th this one, th 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 this one, uh, <laughs> this one a little more yeah. easier for me. Uh, I'm going to go Tyler Lockett here, right? Um, before he got hurt, he had the uh, you know the six the six game scoring streak where he scored a touchdown in six straight games up until week 15. Got hurt with the hand. He was out week 16. Came back week 17 just to get his feet wet, and he scores again in week 18. So, you know, um, D DK Metcalf in the past five games, he's averaged eight targets a game. He's getting four and a half catches, but only for 50 yards, and he's not scoring the touchdowns. Lockett is the touchdown guy, so I'm, I'm banking on that and, and leaning Lockett a little bit here. Two games against San Francisco this year. DK Metcalf held under 60 yards in both those games. Tyler Lockett uh, had at least seven receptions and at least 65 yards in both games against the 49ers. He's the guy that, to me, is more likely just on one big play. Right. You know, if they're down in this game and they're throwing, it feels like – at least in the previous two games, that's what we have to go off of, is that um, uh, the 49ers defense has basically said, like, we'll take our chances with a couple of shots, but we need to shut down DK Metcalf. That's the guy that scares us more than Tyler Lockett. So that's right. where the focal point of our defense is. Their defense, I don't know that they necessarily, they can keep up with the speed of Tyler Lockett, but they have the size and physicality to deal with DK Metcalf. And so, yeah, I, I prefer Lockett to Metcalf as well. Yep. I think he's also likelier to have one big play. I agree. Before we go, move off of this game, Geno Pitt and Geno Smith to throw a pick on MGM is minus 145. He's throwing a pick in this game. He threw a pick six against the Niners. It was called back because of a rubbish Nick Bosa roughing penalty. He's going to throw one uh, this weekend. Like Let's go to Giants-Vikings. The Vikings are three-point favorites. These teams played a few weeks ago. The Vikings then were four-and-a-half-point favorites. Uh, they are going in the wrong direction. The Giants are going in the right direction. They're getting healthier. The total here is 48. Matthew, Ooh. who do you think the better play is between Daniel Jones and Kirk Cousins? Whoa. This one's tough. They're the same player. It, they, I mean, they really are. They I do mean, it in I, different ways, but they're the same kind of player at the end of the day. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say Kirk Cousins just because this game is at home where he averages over 19 fantasy points per game. Daniel Jones has the rushing, which gives him the floor. But you know what? Screw it. Give me the guy that gets to throw to Justin Jefferson. Yeah, so I, I'm going to take... I'm going to take Kirk Cousins here. Uh, I think both are, are pretty close. I mean, like, again, he the, the one time they played, 24-point fantasy points against the Giants. He was the third-best quarterback in fantasy in Week 16. Yeah, I'm going to go, I'm going to go Kirk Cousins. All right, Lawrence, Saquon Barkley or Dalvin Cook? Saquon is $800 more expensive. Oh, $800. Yeah, I, thought you, gonna, I yeah, thought, you gonna say, I, I thought you was going to say, I thought you was going to say, like, 300 more. But, you know, the last three weeks – so the Giants have fine, like later in the season they finally said, "Oh snap, our running back is good in a receiving game." So the last three weeks or the last his last three games rather because he didn't play Week 18, over seven targets a game and five catches in that time. Also in that span, 20 touches per game. That's something they kind of got away from, um, and, and pretty much aside from the the game against the Colts where Daniel Jones went off. When the Giants win, more than likely, Saquon Barkley is getting 20 touches and he's having a good game. So give me him. He don't have to worry about Alexander Madison. 
Yeah, I think volume is the right case here with Saquon Barkley. He's had at least 20 touches in 10 of 16 games, three-point underdogs here. So the game should be close enough that it doesn't get away from them. He's involved in all three, uh, all three downs, all three facets of their of their offense. So. Yeah, to me, Saquon Barkley, again, Dalvin Cook just, yeah, there's a little bit of Alexander Madison vulture concerns there as well. They also have other weapons between Justin Jefferson and Thielen and K.J. Osborne and T.J. Hawkinson. There's just, you feel better about Saquon Barkley's ability to get into the end zone than you do necessarily about Dalvin Cook because there's just, there's less weapons on the New York Giants. I'd rather take my chances against Richie James and Isaiah Hodgins right. than Justin Jefferson and uh, TJ Hawkinson in the red zone. Yep. All right. Quickly, pick one. Slayton, Hodgins, Richie James. Who do you want out of those three? You know what? I I'm going to go with I'm going to go with Richie James, right? Nah. 17 fantasy points in week 16 <laughs> yeah. against these Minnesota Vikings. Uh, like he's had 60 or more receiving yards in three of the last four games. Here, I, it just feels like that slot position is where uh, Daniel Jones is comfortable throwing between the numbers, it is. between the hashes. So I think he's got the highest floor here. Hodgins has been on a, on a, you know, four touchdowns in his last five games. But the boy, to me, the the floor play here is Richie James. He's also the cheapest uh, at oh, really? 3,900 ah, on DraftKings. Slayton's at yeah. 4,200. Hodgins is at 4,100. But uh, I do think the slot is an area where you can attack Minnesota. Okay, let's go to Bucks Cowboys. The Bucks are two and a half point favor, two and a half point underdogs uh, at home to the Cowboys. The total is 45 and a half. Lawrence, Dak Prescott, Tom Brady, uneven, kind of disappointing seasons for both of them. Uh, on DraftKings, Dak is $100 more expensive. Who do you want between these two guys? And I don't even need no stats for this. This is playoffs, and this is Tom Brady. And, okay, I'll give you one stat. In <laughs> Dak's last three playoff games, he's only thrown for one touchdown. Wow. That's not great. Seven straight games with an interception for Dak Prescott. Yeah. Under 300 passing yards in 11 out of 12 games. Under 20 fantasy points in five of the last seven. He's also more expensive than Tom Brady. Yeah, no thank you. I, I just – Dak has not looked like Dak. He looked awful against my commanders. He's dreadful. He looked, he looked really, really bad. This game's in Tampa Bay. I think the Buccaneers, I think they go very – I think the Cowboys try to go balanced here and try to go candidly run heavy. So I, I don't want any part of Dak Prescott. I candidly don't really would love – I'd love to kind of avoid this game. I think yeah. this game's going to be ugly. And if I had to pick one player out of this game, give me Chris Godwin. Okay. Or yeah, C right. Or CeeDee Lamb. Those two guys I think probably have a decent floor. But – I think the running backs on the Cowboys split the carries against a very tough run uh, Buccaneers run defense here. And again, you don't feel great about the Buccaneers run game. Like I, I think it's I like the under on 45 and a half. This feels like a low scoring game between two good defenses and two offenses that haven't hit their stride. Yep. No, I like that. And uh, let's get into some other bets as well as we take a look at some of my best bets uh, on the NFC card. And, you know, starting with that game with Cowboys Bucks, I like the Bucks in this game. And, uh, Matthew, you talked about it yep. earlier in the week, but I don't understand why the Bucks aren't favored in this game. Cowboys pass defense has fallen off a cliff. They've been 29th uh, in dropback EPA allowed. That's a fancy term, but it just means the Cowboys have been bad for the past five weeks. So I think the Bucks will be able to throw. And I think Dak is just, he, I don't know what's wrong with Dak, but something's wrong with him. Some rumors that he might've got banged up against the Titans. He has not looked right. And then the other two games, DK Metcalf under 61 and a half receiving yards. We spoke about this. I think Chavarius Ward, the Niners by far their strongest corner. He will go to DK Metcalf. Lockett will get the easier matchup against Lenoir, so I think that Lockett will be the target for Geno Smith, and DK goes under, as he has in both of the games against the Niners so far. And then Giants-Vikings. I like the under in this game as well. The total is 48. Vikings are really banged up on the offensive line. Brian O'Neill, he is done for the season. Garrett Bradbury is banged up. Vikings have not been able to run the ball ever since TJ Hawkinson got there. I don't think that's TJ Hawkinson's fault, but they just are not running the ball. So Justin Jefferson focused. So I think that, that game is going to be a little bit uglier than expected. What do you think, yeah, guys? Those I, are approved? I, I like all those bets. I mean, look, yeah. we talked about DK Metcalf. He's been under he's been under 60 yards in each of the first two games here. So the fact that the line's 61 and a half, I like the under there. Yeah, I, I think the Buccaneers win this straight up. Yep. I'd actually like the Buccaneers on the money line. Yep. So, yeah, if you're going to get points, I, I don't mind taking the two and a half as well there with, uh, with with Tampa Bay. And, yeah, I like the call on the under there for um, for the Giants. That one makes me a little bit nervous. I probably wouldn't do that just because I think that could 
that's a game that could also you could easily sure. see yeah. both defenses that have been inconsistent this year. Giants uh, defense is healthier though. They've gotten all their guys back. Yep. Uh, Ojalari comes back. Adoree Jackson is going to come back as well. We expect they uh, their him. best corner. Uh, so I do think the Giants, their defense is a little bit better than expected. But, uh, but it, I mean, it is a, it is a playoff game. You could see Kirk Cousins throwing a pick six here. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Which he's could not, hurt. He's could not hurt afraid over. to do that. All right, we're going to go to break. When we come back, we'll break down Super Bowl MVP odds on BetMGM. Hey, it's Matthew Berry from NBC Sports and Rotoworld.com. Just want to thank you so much for watching what you just watched, or at least being too lazy to click out of it after the you know autoplay just kept it going. So either way, thank you so much for just letting it scroll by your screen. And now I'd like to ask you respectfully, 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 okay, respectfully, please subscribe to the NFL on NBC YouTube channel for the latest NFL news, fantasy headlines from Rotoworld, and betting analysis from NBC Sports Edge.